we're going to look at how God's grace empowers us in the midst of turmoil, of trials, of suffering, and that's where we're going to be today. I wanted to start out real quick, though. Um, I want to ask you a question, and this is going to be an interactive question, okay? How many of you here have a part of your, well, let me just ask you this, I, and I want to raise a hand, okay? So please be honest. It's okay. We're brothers and sisters. There's no judgment here, right? This is the church. We don't judge one another. Come on. Raise your hands if you would consider yourself a prepper. You know what I mean? My mom and dad would have to raise their hand. Raise your hand. Okay, if you would say, okay, now put your hand down. Now I'm going to ask a different question. How many of you have a portion or a place in your house for things that you have stockpiled just in case? You know, a little food, a little water, some gas, you know, uh, a stove or something. Now raise your hands. Now raise your hands. Does that include ammunition? That includes ammunition. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah, all right. Okay, so let me, let me say, if you raise your hand at any point in that, you are a prepper. Okay, and stop. Most of you didn't consider yourselves that because you don't want to be that, right? You don't want to be labeled as a freak. Right, Mom? You don't care. No, right? Yeah. You don't want to be labeled as the doomsday or the end of the world person. But do you realize... The fra you know, we all have to realize that or have had these thoughts in our minds of the f fragility, I almost said fragileness, I don't think that's a word either, <laughs> fragility of the world we live in, right? At any moment, things could happen, bad things could happen. We could, uh, you know, the power grid could go down. That means the microwave is gone. That means the, the heat in my house is gone, right? Unless you have gas. You know, say there's info, there's certain things that could happen, and the question is, are you prepared for those things? I'll give you just a. I'm going to read some book titles to you. If you search top prepper books out there, it's awesome. <laughs> How to survive the end of the world as we know it, part two. <laughs> That's literally on the list here. Um. When All Hell Breaks Loose. I'm, I'm reading these titles because they're, they're kind of funny and shocking, but these, these are people, these are books to help you prepare for when all hell breaks loose, I guess. Right, let's keep going here. Back to the Basics, A Complete Guide to Traditional Skills. This is the third edition of this book. Outdoor, uh, outdoor Knots Book. Hmm, interesting. Um... If you ain't a preppin', best be a steppin'. I made that one up, sorry. I just couldn't. No. The Doctor's Book of Home Remedies. Emergency War Strategies. Not kidding. Special Forces Guerrilla Warfare Manual. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, 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 you can catch me later on where to get that one on Amazon, right? Boston's Gun Bible. <laughs> you and the police. One nation under surveillance. Privacy from a watchful eye. Anyway, now here I'm reading these titles because th you, these are books obviously you can go and get. Uh, and I know that you probably know this, but in the last year, the, uh, the number of survival books that is out there has grown exponentially, right? The number of books on how to be prepared when something bad happens has grown exponentially. Now, how many of us take the same seriousness to being prepared as a Christian for when the world is going to turn on you? When the world is not going to accept your faith? Have you guys looked at what's happening in our world lately? Do you believe that we're becoming a more Christian nation? We're not. Your freedoms and my freedoms that we exist now for us to, to worship God the way we do, it, they're going to come to an end. This church is going to uh, have to capitulate at some point to a nation that is not, not Christian anymore. So how do you and I handle that? The, the reality is that the church has been doing this for millennia. 
For at least two millennia, the church has been under surveillance, has been persecuted. So it's never a question. We just happen to live in a very unique period of time in a very unique country on a very uh, interesting planet that allows us this freedom to worship God and to do this w uh, relatively unencumbered. But that's not always going to be the case. So Peter preps the church how do we handle, how are we enabled by God's grace to, to live? And what do these powers allow us to do? So look at your text. We're going to see how God's grace empowers us. So look at the first thing. God's grace, I would say, it's on your little sheet, God's grace empowers us to be mentally prepared. And that's what a lot of this is about. He wants us to be mentally prepared for suffering. Look at your text with me, would you? Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. Peter is telling the Christians in Pontia, Galatia, Cappadocia, he's telling the Christians... That you, these things, these ordeals, these fiery ordeals are coming on you and our job is not to go, oh my gosh, how dare you? And to be all uh, broken up. Our job as Christians, our expectation should be that they are coming and to be mentally prepared for them to come. Let me give you a, something interesting. That phrase, the fiery ordeal among you, the Greek literally translates that, the among you burning. Now stop for just a second. I don't know if you guys know much about your, your history, but uh, Peter wrote this book almost uh, very close to the end of his life and in such a way as uh, he ultimately died at the hands of Nero. And Nero was the, uh, an emperor in Rome who uh, really gave the first large per, uh, or mass persecution of Christians. Um, there were several persecutions that happened prior to Nero throughout the Jewish, uh, different Jewish-led uh, 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 ruled areas. But as far as the Roman ruled areas, Nero really gave the largest uh, persecution of the church where he killed hundreds and thousands of Christians. And... Uh, there's a, a legend or a story that when Rome burned, that Nero set the fire. That he's the one that set the fire, but he blamed the church. Now that's, that's, that's just a legend. We don't know that for sure. But we do know for fact that he blamed the Christians. He blamed the Christians and therefore launched from that the persecution of the church. We have actual historical documents, articles from uh, antiquity. I talk about what Nero did. One of the things he did in his, in his royal garden was to take Christians and to cover them in pitch or tar and to light them on fire and burn them as lamps for his parties. Now I want to read this again. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeals among you. Do not be surprised at the among you burning See, we have this concept of persecution that, oh, the government's not going to, it's going to force me to bake a cake for something, some situation that I don't necessarily agree with. Or they're going to come and tell me how we are to worship and the things we're to say and the things we're not to say. That, that's probably at least a reality that we faced in the near future, right? And we're going to be forced to do things that maybe go against culture, or, or that have to capitulate to culture as opposed to going against it. But... But do you realize that Peter is writing this to Christians and saying, hey, don't be surprised if they tar you and hang you up and light you on fire. You see the difference? See, we don't necessarily have a mental preparedness for that. We're mentally prepared for... Um, uh, a, a certain level of government uh, and political uh, control over religion, right? And over our religious freedoms. But we're not prepared to be burnt for it. It's kind of like the prepper who's got about, uh, he's got a, you know, a, he went to Sam's and bought some Denty Moore beef stew. He's got enough for a couple of meals and a gallon of water. 
but he's not ready for all hell to break loose, right? You see the difference? So I say this, church. I say this. Let us have the mindset, not that we need just a couple of cans of Denty more, but let us remember. Let us remember what the church has gone through. And let us realize that we don't, we're not guaranteed the freedom that we have, even though a constitution may say it. We're not guaranteed that freedom. That God in His sovereignty may strip it like He did the Jews with the Babylonians. That He may just come and strip your freedom and put you in bondage, and not only in bondage, but in exile from your country for 70 years. So that you and I could see Him more clearly, could worship Him in more reality, and could be turned from our wicked ways, right? So I think something really important here that he's saying is that you and I, as Christians, have, by God's grace, have the ability to be mentally prepared for this. And I believe in supernatural ways that other people don't. Let's look at the next verse. Look at verse 13. Not only do we have this grace, grace empowers us to be mentally prepared for suffering, His grace empowers us to rejoice in suffering. Talk about an oxymoron, right? Talk about a paradox. This is what's called paradox, paradoxal theology. All right, listen to this. But to the degree that you share in the suffering of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of His glory, you may rejoice with exultation. See, Peter has this idea and the idea is this, the theology is this, that Christ suffered on our behalf, that He chose His suffering, that He allowed Himself to be suffered, to suffer. We know from uh, Philippians chapter 2 that he, he emptied Himself, it's what we call kenosis, that He stripped Himself of His own power. He did not see being one with God something to be grasped, but He lowered Himself and became a man and died on a cross, okay? And the idea being that He suffered, graciously suffered for us. Therefore, in the same manner with which we suffer, we're to look back on what He did and rejoice that we were chosen, that we were allowed to go through something. I liken it to this. You know, um, I played a little football, not a lot, but I played a little bit of football, and I can remember going to two-a-days, okay? When you go into two-a-days, and girls, I'm sorry for this analogy. It was kind of the only one that came to mind. All right? When you go to two-a-days, when you go to this, this extremely difficult, hot, um, if you walk in and you're prepared for it, right? You're prepared because you know what two-a-days means. You know it's not going to be fun. You know it's going to be hard. You know it's going to be uh, uh, just a very painful. It's going to be a struggle. But you know that, that is, it's a requirement because if you don't do this, State really isn't an option. The glory of the win at the end is not an option. There's never been a single football team in the last several decades that has won a state champion that has not had a rigorous two-a-days program. And now I know I think UIL uh, has these rules now that you can't do two-a-days, but you have to do some kind of morning workout, and it can't consist of... Uh, it's just really weird. We've really softened. Our football, I don't know, it's, it's these kids. What are we going to do? I don't know. But the point is, if you knew, for the person going into that, knowing the end, if he knew the end result, if he knew, if he, if he was all of a sudden had a revelation from God that showed up to this football camp and said, my dear children, God always speaks in a British accent, just go with me. My dear children, you shall win state this year. I have chosen you. Fret not for the two days you are about to experience. Peace be with you. <laughs> right? If he did that, how would the two days experience go? Do you think there'd be near as much complaining? Do you think there'd be near as much belly aching? Do you think those kids wouldn't just be like, we're going to win state! Ah! You know, it would just be... They do whatever because they'd already been given the end. So they can rejoice in their suffering. You see that? You and I have been given the end. We already know what happens. 
We know what Christ has already done for us. Therefore, if, we, if, if the government were to come in here and strip us of the title of church and say, you can no longer meet, you know what we can do? We can rejoice. We can sing. We can dance. It's okay. That has no bearing on the end. See my point? Give you a couple of other things. I'm going to just read a few of these things, that, uh, these paradoxical theo theological ideas that we see throughout Scripture. In uh, 1 Peter 4, we have this one of there being joy with Christ in suffering. In Philippians 3.10, we have the fellowship with Christ in suffering, that our suffering somehow brings us into fellowship with Him. In Romans 8.17, we have the understanding of the being glorified with Christ in our suffering. And then in 1 Timothy 2.12, we have the ultimately going to reign with Him. There's this idea, this concept of as Christians, we will reign. Keep reading. Look at verse 14. He says, as if you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed. See the paradox here? The idea is suffering equals blessing. He says this, you're blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. I want you to remember this text. Uh, you've, you've probably quoted it. Uh, it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it's, uh, verse 19 and 20. It says, Or do you not know, this is Paul talking to the church at Corinth, that your body is a temple of what? The Holy Spirit of God who is within you, whom you have from God, and that, not you, that you are not your own. For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Let's look at the next one. The next verse says this. That grace empowers us in a, in a completely different way. It empowers us not to retaliate in suffering. Real fast, before we go on. How many of you, don't, don't raise your hands, I just want to ask this. How many of you are retaliators? Me and Jolene have this little joke. Quinn's a retaliator. Is Quinn in here? He's a retaliator. All right. If you do something to Quinn, he's going to pop you back. All right. If you poke him, he's going to hit you. If you tickle him, he's going to jump on you. And part of that is I've, I've taught him that uh, as a parent. <laughs> he attacks me, I attack him. But in suffering, how many of us retaliate? How many of us make the excuse? I'm just going to use a couple of examples here. You get... Your taxes are due, and you find a way to kind of stick it to the man. Well, guess what? I mean, he's been sticking it to me for years. So I'm going to retaliate, all right? See, something little. I use that because uh, that was really the only one I could think of. But in life, do you do that with your friends? Do you do that with your spouses? That if your spouse does something, we retaliate? Well, in suffering, the church is not... To retaliate. Look at the text with me. He says, make sure that none of you suffer as murderers. Okay, so he's talking about the joy of the blessing in suffering. And now he's saying, look, but don't take it the other direction. It's one thing if you and I suffer for the good. We've already seen how, how Peter has discussed this. If you suffer for good things, that's great. Don't suffer for bad things. If you're going to suffer for the glory of God, great. But... Here he's talking about, don't be a retaliator. He goes, don't suffer. Let none of you suffer as a murderer. In other words, when that suffering comes, when someone, of, when someone you love is killed, don't go kill in return. When your stuff is stole, look, he says, or a thief, don't, don't go take back. If the government comes and takes from us because of who we are as Christians, let's not go take, take it back. He keep, and then he goes to things of evildoers. He's just kind of covering. Uh, none of us suffer as someone who is evil. In other words, we're not to be identified like that. The church is supposed to stand out in a way other than revenge and retaliation. And notice what the last one he says here, which is troublesome meddlers. No one be troublesome meddlers. Now that's not necessarily a, we don't see murder there. We don't see thief there. It's the idea that you and I are, are, well, they've caused me trouble, so I'm going to cause them trouble. Sticking my nose where it doesn't belong 
just to get back. It's this idea of retaliation. You know, I can remember, I'm going to tell on myself again. In uh, first and second grade, there was a couple of bullies in our class. And uh, one of them, I'm just going to give you their first names because uh, they do still exist. Um, one kid's name was Jeremy, and one kid's name was David. When I was in the first grade, I, would hap uh, I was in a car accident, and I had one of my vertebrae, and my back was crushed. <sighs> so it was kind of like a spiderweb fracture. All right? So I couldn't do a whole lot of stuff. Like I had to just, couldn't play, I could, you know, I had to kind of be good. Come on. <laughs> So mom, when she finally sent me back to school, one of the things she said was, now Christopher, don't let anybody jump on your back. Smart parent, right? Well, went into school, teachers were notified, the kids are notified, but we had these two bullies, two kids in our class, Jeremy and David. Well, one day, Jeremy um, comes, he's running up to me, it was pretty quick after I had gotten back to school. And he jumps on my back, full force. And the first reaction was, I turned around and I popped him. I turned around and I swung up and I, Gah! and I hit him with my hand, right in the face. And I broke both of these fingers, <laughs> right here. And I got in trouble. I got in trouble for hitting him. David Hajos. Oh, I said his last name. Dang it. <laughs> hey, buddy. Good to see you. Uh, David. A couple weeks later, we were in the gym. And David comes and he jumps on my back. And I throw him off. I say, don't do that. I learned my lesson. I'm not going to hit him in the face. And he does it again. He runs and he jumps on me again. And I spun him around and I threw him to the ground and he's face down on the ground and I jumped on his back and I smashed his face into the ground. <laughs> I know. And I was like, stop it! And then I saw the blood from his face going to the ground. I was like, and I started weeping. My little heart, oh, I'm so sorry! And I got to go to the principal's office and I got in trouble. And I had to suffer as an evildoer. Instead of just taking it. In both situations, I had to suffer as an evildoer because of my retaliation, because of my inability to control myself. Don't, it's a very childlike thing, isn't it? It seems like, well, Chris, you were only in the first grade, right? You're Jovi's age. We could all see Joby doing that, right? <laughs> right? You're, ju you're just a kid. Exactly. You and I are not to be that way. We're to grow up, right? We're to be adults. We're to be mature. That's not how we live, right? Look at the next thing. Not only are we not to retaliate for suffering, but grace gives us a power to now not be ashamed in our suffering. That we're not going to now, because of our suffering, uh, be like Peter. Remember Peter when, when he's at the crucifixion of Christ and Christ is in his, it's actually in the, uh, the trials of Jesus and he's snuck up to get a glimpse and he's recognized. He responds as one who was ashamed. I don't know him. I'm not the guy you think, I'm, that's not me. I don't know that Jesus. Christians often, when put to persecution, will buckle because... Of fear. He says, wait, you've been empowered by God's grace to not be afraid. You don't have to fear that. You don't have to be ashamed. As a matter of fact, look what he says. He says, but any of you suffers as a Christian. This is a term, Christianos. It's the third time this term is used in the entire New Testament. It's only used three times, and this is the last one. If you were to suffer under this category, in this name, Christianos, Christians, he says, he is not to be ashamed. If you, because of your faith, gets, get persecuted, that's okay. That's okay. Don't be ashamed of God. He says, but, to, but is to glorify God in this name. This name, this Christian. We are to be glorifiers of God in this name. I want you to remember your alma mater. You remember your high school alma mater? 
Are they any good now in sports and anything? Would you call them your alma mater? How about your college alma mater? Is your team losing right now? No? For those of you who are not, you're like, no, we're winning. Are we winning? Is North Texas winning? Is anybody, are we, does anybody even know? Do we even care? <laughs> we are not, is, okay, raise your hand if you are a mean green eagle. Okay, thank you, not ashamed, not ashamed. Raise your hand if you're a mean green eagle and you didn't raise your hand. <laughs> All, right. All right, you see my point? See, often when things are going our way, we're ready to bring glory to God. I'm a Christian. Yeah, woo! Look, we've got, you know, the whole Congress is full of Christians. And look at, you know, when things are, when everybody is, like, excited and on the Christian bandwagon, so are we. But when they're not, what happens to our faith? What happens to our life? We're quick to, I don't know the man. He says, don't be like that. So we're not to be retaliate. We're not to be ashamed. Look at the next section. Look at verse 17. He says, Grace empowers us to gain a perspective of suffering. Now look at this text. This is very interesting. The next couple of verses. He says, For it is time. It is time for judgment. Think about that. It's time. He wrote this almost 2,000 years ago, and he's telling the church then the same thing that we should understand. It's time for our judgment. Look, he says, it's time for judgment to begin with the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel? Now, the, the concept of judgment that is being played out here has two possible interpretations. I want to give you both of them to really help us understand it. The first one is, this could be judgment specific to our own sin. Think about life. Think about our world now. That you and I still have to experience the consequences of our sin. Is it always going to be that way? No. There's going to come a day when you're not going to be experiencing the consequences of your sin anymore. Now, is your eternal consequence of hell and the second death, are you going to pay that? No. Christ has paid that, right? So the one interpretation could mean that this judgment is God's natural judgment on sin. That sin has been judged, that sin has consequences, that you and I are living in this one period of time until Christ returns or until we die, that we have to experience the judgment on us because of our sin. But then he puts it once again into comparison. But what about those who have not trusted, who've not believed the gospel? What about them? So let me ask you this. Has the judgment that you've experienced on this earth for the sins that you've committed, do they compare to eternal damnation? See, he's, he's, he's showing us a perspective here. Our grace, the grace of God allows us to see that perspective. It allows us to see the, the beauty of our salvation even in the midst of our short-term consequences, does it not? A second possible interpretation of this text could mean that he's talking about the judgment we suffer specifically under the hands of non-Christians. So, in other words, as he's been going through this text, contextually, he's been talking about your suffering and my suffering at the hands of the world. And so I, kind of, I believe that that's where we are. However, the other could be true as well. That word judgment doesn't usually get played like a card. It doesn't usually get said outside of the judgment of God. And so that's why two possible interpretations exist here. Either way, the concept is still true. That whether there's the idea of you and I receiving consequences for our sin, which happens, or the reality that we are going to have a judgment from people who don't know what we know, who have not experienced the work of Christ in us as you and I have experienced, the Holy Spirit's work in our life, we're going to be judged and so now the comparison comes. So you had to be judged. So you were burned at the stake. Does even that compare to the eternal judgment that those who have not, who 
trusted in the gospel of God are going to experience? See, see how that happens? See what he's doing here? Keep looking at your text. Verse 18. He says, And if it was difficult that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? You see how he's putting it in context? These two questions. If it's difficult for the righteous to be saved, what would become of the godless man? This is the man without God. The sinner. This is the one who has to bear the punishment of his sin. This actually comes, this is a quote. If your Bible has it in uh, italics or big words, this comes from Proverbs eleven thirty one. It's actually written from the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Okay, the Jews about 70 years before Christ translated the Old Testament into Greek. And Peter is quoting the Greek version of it here. All right? And so the way it's written is that you and I... We're gonna, we have pain in this life as righteous. We have to suffer in the midst of our salvation, right? But it compares nothing to what the godless man is going to experience. I want to I read you something just real quick. This is Revelation chapter 20. Verse 1, we're going to read a few verses here. This is what is called the great white throne judgment. Now, I believe... That the book of Revelation is a, is, is a snapshot of the future. Okay? A lot, of, a lot of people call it the fifth gospel. Okay? Uh, you know what I mean? You, the gospels are a very historical take, uh, but in different, in different uh, uh, viewpoints of Christ and what he did. And Revelation is, a, a lot of people, I'm one, believe it's a very historical take on things. And in verse tw chapter 20 of the book of Revelation, you have... Uh, 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 we have this, these few verses about this judgment that all men will be under. All men who don't know Christ. Now watch this. Read this with me. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. I, I want you to think about God. And showing up and in his glory, the earth, the sun, the moon, in whatever dimension type space we're in, all of a sudden everything runs away, flees, it just get out of his presence because there's something happening right now. Look what he does. And then he said, I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And books were opened. Multiple books, all right? Not just one book. Books were opened. And another book, one book, was opened, which is the book of life. So now, God's got one book specific open. He's got multiple books, other books open. These other books are known as the book of deeds. The Bible talks about the book of deeds, and it's where... Man's life is recorded. What he did is recorded. The book of life is specific to those who've trusted in Christ. It says that this book was written before the foundation of the world. That those who trust who have been, their sins have been covered by the blood of the Messiah, they're in here. And so look what it says. It says the book, uh, seeing the dead were judged... From the things which were written in the books, according to their deeds. So they look across Jesus, or the, uh, God uh, the, the, looks across the different books, and if your name's not written in this one, he looks to the others and he judges you based on your deeds. And watch what happens. In verse 13, and the sea gave up its dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged. Every one of them according to their deeds. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Okay. You see, Peter is trying to paint this picture. We, we often don't read that text, do we? It's, it's funny how we don't want to think about 
What happens to a person once they die, after this life is over? It's a very painful concept to think about those of our friends who don't know Jesus, who have not trusted in Christ, whose names have not, are not written in this book. When God's going to stand them up in front of Himself and look at their deeds and see their unrighteousness act, and their unrighteousness, their acts against Him and judge them for that. Go back to Peter. What will become of the godless man and the sinner? Did your heart break for that one? Does your heart break for that one? For that brother? that sister, that mom, that dad? Does your heart break for your co-worker? Your uncle? Your neighbor? See, church, I really feel like we want utopia. We do. We want to come together. We're about to have a party tonight that's going to be utopian. We want it. So often we live Sunday to Sunday because we just don't want to engage the world. It's too tough. Suffering is too tough. Their judgment on us, their ridicule, the labeling is too tough. I call you, I beg you, let's not be that church. Let's not be that church. Let's remember the godless and the sinner. Let's remember them. Let's look at the last thing. The last couple of verses, or the last verse of the text, verse 19, as we finish up chapter 4. As we go through this, we're to be mentally prepared. Rejoice in our suffering, not retaliate, not be ashamed. Look here. We are to, our God's grace empowers us to trust God in our suffering, to trust Him. Verse 19 Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their soul. To a faithful creator in doing what is right. Give you a, a, in other words, when we are empowered and we're living and we're doing what it's, is right, that's the evidence of us entrusting our soul to this, this God, this creator. You see, what I, see how he says it? So our grace that is given to us gives us in the midst of suffering, in the midst of trial, as purification for you and I comes, this testing of our faith, as he said. When it comes, grace gives us the ability to trust. It gives us the ability to have faith. Have you ever been in a situation asking yourself, God, what are you doing? Gosh, I, I can't imagine there's a person in here who's not necessarily felt that way. God, why did you do this? Why are you allowing me to go through this? Why is that happening? Grace, Christ in us, gives us the ability to trust Him in the midst of that and to recognize that He's the Creator, the same one that spun this world into being. It's funny, we're going through Advent right now at our home, and each, uh, each day we read a different aspect of Scripture and relate it to the coming of Christ. And we just got through doing the creation story and the fall of man. And when you go through the creation story, uh, I've got a, 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 one of those uh, storybook Bibles, and I'm reading it to my kids, and it's got these incredible graphics of how God, you can see almost God speaking and the, the world spinning into existence. That's who we are entrusting our heart to. That's the man. Not just some wooden statue. Not just some etherical concept. He is real. He is actual. He is historical. And you and I have His power in us. Amazing. What an amazing God we have. I think that as we go into this Christmas season, our job is to remember 
Now, no matter what this looks like, no matter if you get laid off, if you got to deal with family that it's doing this, no matter if life doesn't seem fair for you right now, please remember this. We serve a very faithful God. Amen? We serve a God who created the world, but not only in that, we serve a God who emptied himself and became a man to die for your sin and for mine. And not only did he do that, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He sent his spirit to indwell those who trust in him and to guide us. And not only that, he's coming again. Amen.